Hello, and welcome back to the Calm and Connected podcast. I'm your host, Janine Halloran, and I'm so excited today because I get a chance to interview Katie Hurley. I've been following her work for a really long time, ever since she wrote the Happy Kid Handbook, and I'm excited because we got a chance to talk about her new book. So she is a child and adolescent psychotherapist and the author of five books, including her award-winning No More Mean Girls, and her latest release is called The Stress Buster Workbook for Kids. So we get a chance to really dive deep into stress and talk about some strategies that were useful for our clients and for our own kids. And so I really hope you enjoy our interview. Katie, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. I'm so excited to be here. This has been a long time coming. I know. I feel like I've been like sort of following your work since the Happy Kid Handbook. And so I'm super excited to be able to talk with you and share about your new book. But um, for those of pe- people who don't know you, like I've been following you all the time, but other people who haven't, can you tell us a little bit about you and uh, your professional journey? It's been a long one. Um, I, you know, I started out a zillion years ago working in schools as a school-based therapist and later a clinical director. And I was just doing a conference with some old pals from that job uh, just a couple of weeks ago at UCLA. And we were reminiscing and I was like, I miss it so much. And they're like, do you? And I was like, no, I really do. But all right, I miss you guys. Because, <laughs> you know, I've been in private practice for a long time now. So I definitely rely on colleague groups and checking in with colleagues like you and other people just to keep me refreshed and and connect with people. But um, I work for myself. So I'm in private practice. I see children and teens and young adults. Um, I specialize in anxiety disorders and depressive disorders. I see a lot of LGBTQIA youth. Uh, That's been sort of a a sub population that I just sort of have grown over the past few years. I'm out in the Los Angeles area. And I write a lot of books and I speak and I do a lot of things. So I'm online and I'm in person and I'm here and there. And I just, I'm really passionate. You know, the social worker in me is just super passionate about helping people. So I kind of pop up. Some people will say to me, you're everywhere. And I don't feel like I am, but I think I pop up in a lot of places because if someone says, hey, can you help? I'm like, yes, I can. I want to. So it's just, it's, I'm lucky to be able to do all the work I do. Yeah, I think it's really cool because I do. First of all, your Instagram is phenomenal, which I love. Um, Thank and you. so, and I'm always like reposting your things because they're so good. But then you also do a lot of writing for like some pretty big publications. So I love to see your work getting out yeah. there and uh, people using you as a, a person they can go to for expertise in these areas where we really need a lot of expertise right now and mental health and especially around children and adolescents. Absolutely, we sure do. Yep, we Gosh. do. It is a challenge these days. Um, But you know what I love is that you are writing books and you are helping in different ways in there. I love the Stress Buster Workbook. So I just got it. You see all these little tabbies? Like these are like I have. So I also see private clients. And I, as as I was reading through it, I was like, ooh, sticky note. I'm going to do this with this client. Sticky note. I'm going to do this with that client. So I just love it. I love, love, love it. I think it's fantastic. And I'm so glad it's like a children's book. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's like what you've wanted to write for a while. You were saying, I think in the beginning of the book. It is. I mean, I love writing for adults. I love all the, you know, all the great work I get to do with Washington Post and CNN and everyone else and the books I've written, but you know, for kids and you know this, because you wrote an excellent resource for kids. Sometimes the resources for kids are just not as fun as they need to be, you know, or they're just like a little bit above developmental level where they are. And so, you know, if we want to reel them in and we want to get them invested and we want to help them, we have to meet them where they are. And so we have to have lots of fresh ideas and fun ideas and different ways of looking at things that make sense to them because they really interact through the world through play and imagination. So we can really tap into that as educators, as parents, as therapists, you know, to just help them get through this hard stuff, because there's a lot of hard stuff right now. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And I, I think you're right. I think there's, there are a lot of amazing books out there for like families, for counselors, for therapists, for like all those in the helping profession. 
but that's part of why I wrote coping skills for kids. Cause I was like, where, where's the coping skills book? Like, I just need a whole yeah. bunch. Like I just yeah. need, an, I need some fresh ideas. I need something new. And so whenever I find a resource like the stress buster workbook for kids, I'm super thrilled because it gives me some different ideas of like, let's talk about feelings in a different way. Cause you know, every kid, like sometimes it's just that one way of looking at it that really grasps that, that, it, that kid grasps onto that. And then they're like, oh, I get it. I understand. I can do that now. And then it's like, oh my goodness, it feels so good when you figure right. that out. <laughs> For sure. And sometimes people will look at a book like that and they'll say, this is overwhelming. It's too many things. And I'm always careful to say, no, it's not because not everything works for everyone. And so they really have to figure out what is the one that speaks to me that I know I can keep going back to. That's important. Right. And I think to clarify for people, like you don't have to do all the feelings activities, just pick no. one for that one kid that you are thinking about and planning for. Um, yeah. And I think that's where I think people get a little bit overwhelmed. They're like, don't do that. <laughs> There's yeah. so many good ideas. There's so many yeah. good things in there. Um, so I love that this book is focused on stress. And I really enjoyed the beginning where you're talking about like, there's different kinds of stress and not all stress is bad. Can you share a little right. bit more about that? Cause I think people have this idea of like, oh my gosh, the kids are really stressed out and it's horrible. Not necessarily. No, not at all. You know, I always use um, sports or extracurriculars as sort of a good jumping off point for talking about this. Because when you think about a kid who's going off to a soccer game, he or she or they may have sort of this sort of stress energy going into it because they're thinking about, am I going to win? Am I going to lose? Am I going to play a lot? Am I going to start? Am I not going to start? Am I, you know, or my, is my team going to work together today or are we going to not work as well together today? You know, how was our practice last night? So they, they're having all these thoughts in their heads. They don't always communicate all those thoughts and they don't always know how to communicate all those thoughts, but it's running through them. But that's actually a buildup of good, positive stress. And when you think about it as an adult, you know, you do the same thing. And I was so excited to get on this call because I just wanted to talk to you and pick your brain and, and, you know, talk shop with you. That's good stress, right? That's a build up to something exciting that we're going to do. A, you know, a game is something exciting. Um, finishing a big art project is something exciting. A, a band concert at school. All these things have a level of good stress to them. And then there's sometimes there's just stress that's like everyday stress, but that helps us, you know, if we, you know, we're getting through our day and we got to fight through something that stress can kick in and sort of pump up our adrenaline so that we can get through a hard thing, like taking a test, you know, but then there's other stress, right? There's toxic stress, which is just the accumulation of a, a large amount of negative stressors that's just feeling totally overwhelming, or there's just little stressors that pop up here and there, you know, for some kids that build up to a test, there's a little bit element of excitement to it and a little bit of stress, which is why kids go, oh, I'm so stressed, you know, and then they take it and they get a hundred and they're like, oh, I, it was fine. Right. But then for other kids, legitimately tests are very, very stressful and trigger some anxiety and some very negative emotions about it. And so that's sort of bleeding into the negative stress. Um, and so I always tell kids, it's like, it's, we're all a mixture, right? We have ups and downs throughout the day and that's natural. Adults do it too. I talk to them about their window of tolerance. We all have a window of tolerance, right? For stress every day. And so it's, we can expect we're gonna go up, we're gonna go down, we're gonna go up, we're gonna go down. On those ways up, we're gonna try to cope. You know, we're either gonna go into fight, flight or freeze. And if we're in fight or flight, we're actually figuring out how to cope. Sometimes you have to hightail it out of there, right? <laughs> Other times you have to pick a strategy and fight through it. I mean, this is all human and part of being a human. Um, and so the, that window of tolerance is really important to look at because up at the top is hyper arousal where we're really fighting through things. Down at the bottom is hypo arousal where we're checked out, not doing anything. We want to try to stay somewhere in the middle of that window, but it's natural to have the peaks and valleys. And so we just want to pay attention to that. If your kid is always up at the top, you know that stress has become unhealthy. Yes, absolutely. That window of tolerance work is so interesting. And something that I uh, keep telling people whenever I speak is like, your window of tolerance is smaller when there are things that are times that are stressful. So like COVID makes your window of tolerance smaller. 
please be aware of that for yourself and for your clients, for your others. students, because mm -hmm. it is like, why are people getting so mad on the road? Why are people getting so mad at customer service? Like it's people yeah. have a very small window of tolerance right now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Which is spend five minutes on Facebook and you'll see that oh, <laughs> right out goodness. in the open. I know. Yeah. And and people I it's hard, I think, sometimes for people to stop and think before they like write something. And it help like in in some ways I suppose it is cathartic because they get it out. Except like yeah. then it's out there and you can't take it back. And now you've been mean to somebody you don't even know. <laughs> so yeah. and why? <laughs> and yeah. why? And so did it really you, meet your goal? You know? Right. Do you yeah. feel better now? But now you've made somebody else feel really kind of crappy. So like, where do we go from there? <laughs> if it, I think this is an interesting parallel process in terms of stress playing out in real life with kids, because kids are not like little kids. They're obviously not doing it online as much, but they are doing it in person where they snap or they make a comment that's unkind and they know it's unkind, but they say it anyway and they get it out. And then they're like, oh, okay, I have, I released the valve a little bit. So I feel a little bit better. But then of course the guilt sinks in later, but you know, adults are doing it primarily online. And then, you know, and then they're turning around and telling kids don't ever do that, but they're doing it because they're needing to release their valves too. And sometimes people will justify it. Well, I did it on like a newspaper article, you know? So what does the Washington Post care? It, like, well, maybe, maybe the Washington Post doesn't care but maybe somebody reading the comments does. You know, so the, it's all this, you know, where do we release? How does it impact other people? Well, this is what we're wanting to teach kids is like your release has an impact beyond you feeling relief for a minute. So we have to learn how to do it in a healthy way. Right. And in a way that is not hurtful to others. I mean, I yeah. think that's the, that's the tricky part. You can, you can release all you want. Like you can write it down on a piece of paper. Who says you have to like post it on a comment on, on the Washington right. Post? <laughs> Like who said journals, <laughs> right? Yeah. Write it in a journal, write it and rip it up and throw it out. Write it all yeah. where as you want, write everything that you want to call that person, but like, maybe not like where their kids can read it or <laughs> right. <laughs> because right. that's where it gets a little bit like, mm. what would you, I always used to say to the kids when I was working in school, like when they were being like mean to each other, what would, how would you talk to her if her like Nana was standing behind her? Is that how you would talk to her if her grandma was there? Absolutely not. So they could picture her Nana and be kinder. <laughs> Janine, you need to make an Instagram post about this because this is like when everyone needs to hear that. Pretend Nana is there. Just always. <laughs> As a general rule, Nana is there. How are you going to proceed? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good. I will because do that. Because we need this, right? We need to visualize that our words and our actions go beyond the immediate target even you know so yes. we have I to think about that I don't understand like and I always try I I think it's just part of being in the profession like I have to be very careful about my words because I know my words yeah. have a really big impact so I'm For even sure. more careful when I'm writing like it takes me forever to write emails like it's actually painful sometimes <laughs> because same, I don't want same. somebody to like it misinterpret it. And I like, I keep it short and sweet. Like I'd rather talk to you on the phone rather than like, have you read yep. through like my diatribe? No, no, no. Call me. <laughs> so we can talk. <laughs> I hear that. Oh my gosh. Um, well, to get back to the stress buster workbook yeah. for kids, I wanted to just check in about a couple of strategies that I thought were like phenomenal. So um, can you tell me a little bit more about take five? That was one that I like want to do with one of my kids who just is like struggling. So take five is a grounding technique. And if you haven't heard of grounding techniques, it's sort of based in mindfulness. And the reason we use grounding techniques with kids is because you know, I always tell kids, you're going to hear people throughout your life that are going to brag about how they're the best multitaskers, right? They can do everything at once. They can do all these things at once. It's just like a thing. It's like a badge of honor we wear, especially here in America. We do this more in our country than worldwide. <laughs> it's like a disease. Um, so we're always talking about how we're multitasking and we can do everything at once. But the human brain is not actually designed to multitask. So the human brain is designed to task switch and single task really efficiently. If we're task switching really, really quickly, 
we're not doing anything particularly well. We're just doing a lot of things in quick succession, right? And so that's what people think of as multitasking is really rapid fire task switching. And so when we ground ourselves in the present, we kind of slow down our central nervous system and we slow down that urge to do absolutely everything at once. And the reason I talk to them about task switching and how the brain works is because when we get upset, when we go into fight, flight, or freeze, like when a, a, a trigger just, just hits us the wrong way, no matter what it is, and we either feel angry or anxious, scared, um, sometimes overwhelmed with just sadness or emotions we can't even really name, that feeling of just being super flooded with emotion all at once. All these things are common reactions to a variety of triggers. But when we feel that way, if we do a grounding technique and we focus on either the present or positive thoughts about our lives, our brain can't be in overwhelm mode. We move it. We shift it out of the overwhelm task and into the grounding calming task, right? So we can't do both things at the same time. And if we calm ourselves down first, then we can go back to that previous state and recognize, okay, that trigger upset me, but now I can figure out how to work through it because I'm not flooded with emotions anymore. So that's why I love to use grounding techniques with kids. They're also, they're really good at them. They're easy to use. They can do them anywhere and they tend to be pretty good at them. Um, so, so one way to do it is to ground yourself in your senses. So literally like close your eyes, take a slow, deep breath you know, exhale, open your eyes and just name, you know, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you smell? If you're doing that, your brain is not in overwhelm mode. The other way to do it is take five. And so that's one that I created for kids because I really love the power of positive psychology and pairing positive memories and positive thoughts with deep breathing. So I ask them, you know, and they can use their hands to sort of count down as they're doing it. So take five of those slow breaths because the slow breaths are really what calm down our central nervous system. And I always say slow with little kids instead of deep, because if we say take a deep breath, they tend to go, <clears throat> yep. and that doesn't actually calm us down. That actually yep. makes things worse. So if we stay slow, they learn to just really breathe in slowly and breathe out slowly. Um, and then I ask them to, you know, think of four people who care about them right? And then we put down, then we're down to three. And then, um, you know, three things that they really just like or love or make them feel happy or good. And it can be anything. It can be like M&Ms and basketballs, you know, like it doesn't have to be big existential things, just things that make them feel good, right? Two more deep breaths and then think of one either happy memory or funny thing that happened or something that made them feel good recently. So pairing that positive thinking, positive thoughts with deep breathing, it just helps calm down the whole nervous system and it helps write them so that they can go back to that trigger and say, all right, I'm ready for you now. I know how to cope. Oh my gosh. I love it. I, I read that one and I was, because I, I've done, I do five, four, three, two, one grounding all the time with my clients, but I hadn't seen take five before. And I thought this is going to be phenomenal. It's just such a great way. I love that focus on the positive, focus on the good things. And it's like that work of gratitude and how much that really can have an impact on the way you look and see the world. And it's really, it's amazing. It's amazing. So I'm so When glad. they get into the habit of doing that there, because the trick to positive psychology is not sweeping away our negatives. That's not what we do. We want to deal with them, right? Yeah. But we can pause and we can set ourselves, set our intentions and sort of hit the reset so that we calm our brains down first and then return. And when, when kids get into the habit of doing this, I see it all the time in live time. And when you see, you, I know you've had this experience, but when you see a kid do it and it clicks, it's amazing, right? And then they go back and they're like, oh yeah, that wasn't as big as I thought it was. Okay, I know how to proceed. So it's just a way to help them pause, you know, reset themselves and then go back. And oh my solve. gosh. I love it. I, I, and it, I think it's phenomenal. I think it's absolutely, and it is, you're right. Whenever you see a kid, when it clicks, there's something yeah. magical when it clicks for a kid. And I think that's part yeah. of why I still love being a therapist is because you can, you get to see the clicks. <laughs> Me too. I know. I often say to parents, like, I wish you could see the moments the way that I see them because yeah. it's, it is, it's magic. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I'm, I'm glad that you're able to bring that and provide that and share ideas to make that happen. 
Um, something else I noticed in the book was uh, the relaxing story. So I have a client right now who's really anxious, especially at night. And so that one seems like something that actually would really be helpful to him. So can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit more about that one? Yeah. And I'll tell you the origin of those actually was my daughter. So my daughter, who's 15 now, when she was younger, she was not the easy sleeper. Um, my son, was, who's 13, he was an easy sleeper, right? It was almost like he didn't need me and I was devastated, okay? <laughs> like from minute one, he was like, just swaddle me up, put me down, I'm cool. Um, my daughter just, you know, night was, she was one of those kids where night was kind of hard. Um, we've talked about how our kids are both artists. You know, I, sometimes I think the super creative brains, you know, the imagination kind of kicks into high gear at night. I see it all the time with kids I work with, the ones that are highly creative. Sometimes the imagination goes into overdrive at night. And so for her, that would be the thing. Like the lights would go out and she would start just thinking about all these things and like conjuring all these things in her brain and she would have a hard time settling. And so I, I was like, I, I have to come up with something because we can't do this every night, right? I'm tired, I'm a mom. Um, we can't keep going like this. So I started thinking about just meditations and, and this was long before Calm or Stop, Think, Breathe or any of these apps existed, right? This was like analog. So, you know, none of it was available. We're running wild trying to figure it out. So I said, you know, tell me something. You could go anywhere in your imagination, like on a walk through anywhere right now. Where would it be? And she's like, oh, well, like a fairy forest. And I was like, great. You close your eyes, put your stuffed animal on your belly. So you do your deep belly breathing. You want to see it going up and down slowly. I'm going to tell you a story about the fairy forest. So that first night I did that, I probably just I'm making it up on the fly, right? For about seven minutes. And then the next night she's like, I think we should go to a beach. I was like, okay, we're doing this every night now. All right, tonight we're going to go to a beach. So we're walking through and I'm just coming up with, you know, what are the sounds? What are the smells? What, are the, what does it look like? I really just descriptions, right? Um, and each night we started to do this. And then she told me about a couple months into it, she said, you know, sometimes if I wake up and I'm worried that I can't fall back to sleep, I use a dream disc. And I was like, what's a dream disc? And she's like, um, it's where I stored all your stories in my brain. And I just pick one. And then I re-listen to it. And it helps me go back to sleep. And I was like, wow, dream discs, like <laughs> genius, right? What a great way to think of it. And so, I mean, this is when people call it discs. But, you know, so we, I sort of developed that. I started doing it with kids. I'm like, look, let's do this. Let's come up with some relaxing stories. You tell me and I'll, we'll work it out together. I'll write down what you're saying. I will literally sit in session and I'll type out their relaxing stories that we work up together and send in, you know, email it to mom or dad, send it home so they can either read it. Um, kids will learn to sort of memorize them and then they'll learn to take their own relaxing walks. It's just a way to really use mindfulness um, and just kind of think of like, what are the sensory things that calm me down? What are the places where I would feel calm and relaxed? And it helps them drift off to sleep. Oh my gosh. I love that. And you know what? I think it is that creative brain. My daughter is the same way. I think our daughters are very like similar because that's yeah. my daughter was like the same. Like she, I would put her down as a baby and like her eyes would open up. It was like a baby doll. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the ones that had like the same. eyes that were open. Yeah. And I'd be like, are you kidding me right now? Um, but yeah. here we are. And my son was like, I'm good. If you could just nurse me and like put me in the crib, I'll right. be fine. Even right. with that, without yeah. a swaddle, like that, I'm like, who are you? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, and it's the same thing. Like her brain just went into overdrive and she like imagines all these things coming out. I'm going to actually try this with her and my clients. Cause I think it would be really helpful for her. That's so cool. I love, it's neat how, you know, you get this, you start, you try different things, right? Yeah. And then it becomes something that you try with your clients and you're like, oh gosh, it's really working. Right. And here we are typing up a story. I love that. I think that's phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> so and it's cool. like, I'm sure people have been doing this for centuries. It's like, why didn't anyone tell me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, Part of why I write these books and these things is like, please tell me, <laughs> you know, don't make everyone, it's like, everybody's going first all the time. Why can't we? share more what works and what helps because we're not the only ones with kids who have trouble settling at night that's a that's a common issue right 
Right, um, exactly. And I, I, it's so, it's, I love being able to work with other people who are sharing, like, I love hearing new sessions, new ideas for things to do. Cause gosh, you. like you sit in a session with a kid and you like, you have, of course I have a ton of ideas of things we can do, but I'm, I, sometimes I'm like, I'm tired or I'm bored of yeah. that, or it's not working. And yep. I like, I want something different. I want to shift it a little bit differently. So yeah, I've talked about like, imagine your favorite place, but never in the form of a story. And so yeah. that makes, that is different when you're like laying in bed and you're like, that's when your brain, like their brains come alive, man. And yep. that's like really creative time, but it's like not helpful. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's not yeah. helpful at that moment. It's like write down not the right time. Right. Write yeah. down your creative ideas and all the things that you yeah. want to do with your life. And then like, let's move on. Oh my goodness. It's so funny. Um, is there one strategy in the book that you really love that you would say is like your favorite? I know people ask me that all the time and I know it's a really hard question, but I didn't know if there was one that you had. <laughs> It is a hard question. I would say one I'm using a lot right now is the boundaries manifesto. I'm finding that kids don't know how to set boundaries for themselves and they don't know how to say no. And I think one thing about being a kid is like from the minute you can talk, adults tell you that you can't say no to them, <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> so no becomes like this bad word and then it becomes the powerful word that toddlers use because it's all they got in their arsenal. So it's like, no, no, I'm not even gonna eat that lollipop, right? So they they sort of use it over and over again and then it, it becomes more heated, it becomes more of an issue. I don't want a kid who's defiant. So, right. you know, don't say no. So it's kind of messaging that's like subliminal and sometimes overt that they hear over and over again. And then they get to be later elementary school or heading into middle school and they don't know how to set boundaries for themselves. They don't know how to say no. Um, they don't know how to stand up for themselves. And so I'm really working with kids on that. It's really, and I'm sure you're seeing this too, an issue with technology. So even if they're not on social media yet, um, playing Roblox, some of the other games, you know, using Discord to play games, yes. really hard to step out, right? To walk yeah. away from these things or to say, no, they'll try to blame their parents. They'll try to come up with reasons they can't do it. And I always say, I mean, always give your kids an out, right? I mean, I do the same thing. It's like, you can always blame me. Anytime you need to blame me, I'm happy to be the mean mom who won't let you do things. But I really want kids, my own and everyone else's to be able to say no for themselves because that's how we learn to do it as adults. So if we grow up only ever saying, oh, no, I can't do it because my mom said so. No, my dad's really strict. No, my grandma doesn't let me. We don't learn how to set the boundaries for ourselves. And then we grow into adults who don't know how to do it. So the time to practice is when they're young. So I'm trying to empower our kids that it is okay to use the word no. And no is a complete sentence. You don't have to explain every decision you make. You don't always owe someone an explanation. If you don't want to go to a party for some reason, you're not a party person, you're introverted, it's just too much, you're exhausted, it's still a pandemic, whatever it is, right? You can just say, thank you for the invitation, but no, I can't make it. You know, that's an example of a kid learning to set a boundary. Oh, thank you for including me. No, I don't play games at night because I know it makes me too hopped up. You know, we're allowed to just say no and set our own boundaries and set boundaries on you know, play dates. I was talking to a little girl recently who was like, well, I love play dates with my friends. They always want to stay for like three hours and that's too long, Katie. I said, that is too long. I agree. <laughs> so you could set a time limit. You could say, well, I'm free from one to two or two to three or whatever it is around your school schedule. Set a time frame. you know, learn how to do that. Protect your time so that you have time to go and read or draw or whatever it is you like to do to recoup. Um, so that's just something I've really been working on with kids a lot lately because, and I think in the pandemic, during some of the closures, during the, you know, Zoom schooling and all that stuff, we all lost our boundaries. I mean, I know I did, I can't speak for everyone, but it's like, it went from, I always did some virtual work um, just as part of my practice, but it went from, you don't contact your therapist except during the work day to like people texting me at two in the morning, you know, not because we're all home, right? All the rules went out the window. Everything changed. It wasn't deliberate. It wasn't people like, oh, I, I need this right now. It was just like, oh, I'm thinking of it. I'm going to do it. I'm, I can't sleep. It's a pandemic. You know, it, it wasn't anything, you know, it didn't come from a bad place at all, but we all lost our boundaries. 
Oh yeah. I would completely a hundred percent agree. And like, I can still, it's, it's an interesting sort of thing. Like with the families that I work with, like the families that I saw before, during, and like now I have a different sort of relationship with them than families that I started with like recently. And it's yeah. because we like lived through it together. You did and, it together. Yeah. And, and so it's like a very interesting, it's like, I, I actually think it's kind of precious, but like at yes, the same time to be like su- still super careful, like we got to like scale back. Cause like I would, they would ask like, well, what are your kids doing? Because we all live in different towns and everybody's town's yeah. doing something different and blah, blah, blah. So I, I totally agree. I, it is lovely and I won't give that up, but at the same time, no, I also yeah. still need to be like, no, you can't text me. P.S. Like, right. it's, like <laughs> right. it's not like, it's not all right. Like we're not going to have a continent now. <laughs> so yeah. it's real. It's tricky. Right. Oh my goodness. It is but- tricky. Yeah. And everybody's a little different too. It's like, I don't mind the texts. I don't want them after seven at night. You know, if, when I shut my office door, it's done, but it's just like, you know, it's different times. I don't have, a, you know, when we started out, you and I back in the dark ages, yeah. it's like, I had a pager, you know, <laughs> I know. was for well, emergencies only. I know. You know, I know. And I actually, I don't mind if my family's text, I would actually prefer them to text or email me than to call me. Yeah. Like I would a hundred percent. And I always like, if they text me, I respond, but I also know like in terms of boundaries, I put my phone on do not disturb at nine and it doesn't go on yeah. until seven ag- again. And so people, that's like, right. if you text me after that, I like, I might see it if I'm still awake. Cause that's, and that's like, not going to hear from me. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm not responding until I'm starting my work day the next day. But like yeah. my families are actually like amazingly respectful of that. It's yeah. Like, it's yeah. like, it's really, it, and so they're, they have good boundaries too, which is like lovely. Which is um, good. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's really good. Um, so as we are wrapping up, I just want to have, I have one more question for you. What are your coping skills? How do you rest and recharge? I really have been working on this a lot. I would say in the last couple of years, I was, I mean, I've always been someone who's paid attention to my needs. Um, and one of the things in the book is the feelings, thoughts, and needs inventory. And I do this all the time for myself (laughs) and I do it on my kids. Like what's the feeling? What's the thinking in your brain? Okay. What do you need to get through this? Um, so I do this for myself just so that I'm actually thinking through what I'm feeling and how I'm responding to stressors and things. But as sort of my regular, I mean, I run almost every day. I'm not a professional runner by any means. I can bang out two and a half and that's about my max. <laughs> I'm not running any 5Ks. I'm not running half marathons, <laughs> but I like the process of just thinking. I don't even listen to music. Um, I just think and just run and think and it's just time that I'm just by myself and doing something healthy for my body so that's something I make sure to do I go to bed at 9 30 almost every night Um, I just don't stay up late I know that if I do I get too tired and I can't cope the next day (laughs) so I've learned to regulate my sleep Um, but in terms of just sort of more outside the box like what what do you do to to get through things in the summer I garden yeah. And I didn't grow up with a mom who had a garden. So it was sort of like, a, I'm going to wing it and see if I can grow things. And I really love it. I love my plants. I really love my tomatoes. I talk to them. <laughs> I, just, I just enjoy the process of watching something grow, taking care of it, you know, having this thing that I like nurturing and digging in the soil. I find I really like it. It's not something I ever thought I would like, but I find I like it. And then crossword puzzles and baking those are kind of my things that's awesome I actually I think so I didn't grow up with a fam, um, a par- parents who gardens but my grandfather gardened and so uh-huh. I started garden I never gardened with him but like some something in me was like I want a garden and my mom's like you know your grandfather had this like amazing garden and like my great-grandparents had a farm so like I had no idea and I'm not great at it, I'll be honest with you. But like, I enjoy the process of it. I, yeah. There's something like really exciting about like, it goes from this little bud and like just the, watching the whole process is really cool. And I will, like I grew tomatoes this past summer, but like nobody ate the tomatoes but me, but that's fine. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> that's fine. I Work love for you. Yeah. It was delicious and I will not grow three tomato plants next year. So <laughs> have you grown cucumbers? 
Yes. Um, <laughs> wow. No one <laughs> warns you that one cucumber plant is like 7 billion cucumbers. So oh. like one year, I think I planted six cucumber plants. Oh gosh. <laughs> it was like, who else? I've been putting out bowls of cucumbers yeah. in the driveway. Please take these cucumbers. Somebody um, get the them. The neighbors got a kick out of it. But it is an interesting, you know, and like corn was a giant spectacular failure, but it was kind of funny. The kids and I got a kick out of it. We, you know, and then we researched like, well, what did I do wrong? A lot of things. <laughs> Who knew you're supposed to fluff them every day? I mean, I don't know. So I, it's kind of a fun, I do feel like it's a good metaphor for life in a way. You yeah. know, you have some failures, you have some wins, you work at it, you learn, you keep going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, I, I grew potatoes one year and that was oh, yeah. an absolute outright failure. Like, complete, <laughs> like they died, like hardcore died. And then like when I'm digging up the garden the next year with my daughter, she's like, there's a, like, there's an old potato in here. But then we did, like did the potato bags and it was like really cool to do the potato bags. It's just, you know, Fun. you keep trying, yeah. you keep yeah. trying, You like, if you fail first, try again, like figure try it again. out, try again. Yeah. And so we did. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing those uh, coping skills and your, the way that you like to rest and recharge. And thanks so much for being on the podcast. I've had such a good time. Thank you. No, this was fun for me. Such a treat. And if people want to learn more about you, where should they go? Well, I think Instagram is probably the most fun place to hang out with me. So I'm at Katie F. Hurley on Instagram, uh, but they can find me on Facebook. I actually have two parent groups on Facebook. I have a group, a private group for parents of teens and a private group for parents of littles. So yeah. sort of the preschool through elementary. So that's just a great brave space for parents to show up, talk to each other, ask each other questions. It's really I pop in and out here and there throughout the week, but honestly, I would say the parents are running it themselves and they're really connecting and just finding a nice source of support. Oh my goodness. So helpful and so needed to find a place that feels safe and feels accepting yeah. and comforting, but like you can yeah. actually get some like good information too. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Janine.